The following program is a production of the Barroom Network. It is intended for all audiences. Doug Buffoon. This defense sucks. This is moronic. John Buffoon. If your best run plays are coming off end arounds, there's a problem. Doug was behind the microphone first. He never held back. Very difficult to score when your offense is on the bench. When your defense is out there giving up 70, 80, 70, 64 yard drives. Now, it's his nephew, John, and there's no holding this buffoon back either. An offensive minded coach that's running an offense that got nine yards and a half. A beaten up defense that isn't necessarily performing in key situations. And a quarterback that was expected to take a big step forward looks like an unsalvageable wreck. I've had it! I have had it! I want somebody to get kicked in the ass! How many games can you rattle off that involve the team running the ball seven times and they win? I can't think of any. I don't mind you getting beat. I got my ass whipped many times. But I tell you, I took somebody down with me. Because Bears fans wanted to believe in the worst way that Chicago had a stable, competitive franchise. And this is what we got. It's Buffone 55, the John Buffone Show. Hello and welcome to another special off-season edition of Buffone 55. The off-season drags on and so does our contempt for our beloved Chicago Bears. I'm John Buffone and with me as always is my producer and co-host Alyssa Barbieri. Alyssa, how are you doing today? I'm doing as well as one can be during this Bears off-season. I mean, you, you know, John. They never cease to disappoint us, and there's there's always gonna be uh, there's always gonna be something that we're like I said. There's no off season in podcasting. We've talked about this before, and there's especially no off there's especially no off season for Bears podcasting because there's always something to be mad about, and we're gonna get to a lot of those things that we're mad about. And like I said, Alyssa, the off season uh, is 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 going forward, but we're going off the rails as far as this show goes. We're throwing structure to the wind. We may be doing that all the way up until August. Who knows? Uh, but we do have two awesome guests tonight can you give our listeners a rundown absolutely so tonight's show is going to have three segments we're going to get things started in just a minute with jason waltner senior director of pr at dynasty football factory jason has been following the nfl salary cap for nearly two decades and will help us break down the bear situation then later on, we're going to have Robert Schmitz of Windy City Gridiron on the show to break down the Bears QB1, Andy Dalton, and he'll let Bears fans know what they can expect out of the quarterback position in 2021. Then finally, we're going to finish things up with a segment that we call Buffon's Basement, where Aldo Gandia is going to, jo to join John and me, and the three of us are going to laugh, we're going to cry, and we're definitely going to vent about the current state of these Bears. So, John, take it away. Thank you, Alyssa. Like you said, our first guest has been following the NFL salary cap for a long time, and he's going to let us know if the Bears are sunk or if there's some light at the end of the salary cap tunnel. We now welcome Jason Waltner to Buffon 55. Jason, how are you doing? Appreciate you being on. Oh, I'm doing great, sir. Thank you for having me on. Uh, just love breaking down the cap, helping people understand it. And uh, yeah, we're going to get, get, get some fun stuff here with these Bears. Yeah, let's get to that fun stuff, as 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 you refer to it. I'm not sure <laughs> yeah. Chicago fans would call it as fun, but I, I there's a lot of questions that Bears fans have, and they they want to get some simple answers to it rather than sure. getting too deep into the weeds. So, in your opinion, someone that follows the cap pretty closely, who would you say has the worst contract on the Chicago Bears? Because when you first think about it, automatically think of, oh, well, it's probably Nick Foles, or maybe it's Robert Quinn who's not producing because of that massive salary, or Eddie Jackson, or maybe even Khalil Mack. When you look over that Bears roster, who do you think actually has the worst contract? Uh, so me being a Cowboys fan, uh, you guys, I have to thank you for giving us a fourth round comp pick for you guys uh signing robert quinn to that absolutely atrocious deal that it's a it's not even just how much money he guys is the structure of the deal is this really bad um basically he's going to be almost a 15 million dollar cap hit for you guys this year that puts him probably in the top 10 i can double check on that but the issue that it comes with is that if you were to straight out cut him you guys would 
probably you would save about negative ten million dollars in money. Which that's usually not the that's way not you want to go. That's not the way you want to go. Um, now, just looking at as straight cuts, the first year I can see them getting out of it, and you're not going to want to hear this. I'm sorry, just, just giving the facts. Um, 2023. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. He'll be 33 years old at that point. He'll be a 17 million dollar cap hit with only 6.2 million dollars in dead money. So. Uh, it would actually be about $11 million in savings if you guys move on from him. Now, there is one thing that they could do uh, next year, which, I mean, I don't know. It depends on how you feel about it. Uh, there is, and I, I mean, if you guys have any cap questions, let me know. But there is uh, a designation that teams get. Um, it's called a June 1st designation. They get to designate two players with this thing, with this uh, tag, for lack of a better phrase. And what that does is it allows the team to spread the dead cap hit over two seasons as opposed to only one. So, again, um, usually – and just so you know, the reason why I call it a June 1st cut is anytime a player is cut after June 1st, this is how it affects the salary cap. It will split dead money into two years, this year and the year following. So, with that being said, if they use the, a June 1st designation on him, this means they won't have to wait um, – in 2022, next year, off season, they would save almost $13 million towards the cap for that year with only a $3 million dead money hit in 2022 and a $6.2 million dead money hit in 2023. So honestly, as I could see them using that designation uh, to cut him, because then by then he'll be 32 years old. Like you said, he's barely produced, if anything at all. Um, so... Yeah, so next year there is a there is a wiggle room for them to maneuver to get out of his deal. Yeah, and much you can take a understand a bad contract if he's if he's producing on the field, but he's not. And and no. all and but also we're gonna see if this new scheme, the new defensive coordinator, actually plays to his strengths because we saw Robert Quinn in coverage way too many times last year, and that's not something that he exactly uh, excels at. So we will see. But if not, it sounds like they might at least have a little bit of wiggle room if there's a new GM, if there's a new head coach next year, which a lot of Bears fans are predicting, uh, they might they might have uh, some wiggle room when it comes to Quinn's contract, at least being able to spread that over the next two years. But I wanted to ask you kind of holistically, when you were looking over this Bears roster and you look at these contracts, mm -hmm. the Bears are apparently in win now mode. The way that they act, like they 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 think that this is that they're gonna give it. They're gonna get the band back together, and they're gonna give it one more college try. Uh, when you look over this contract, was this team maybe better suited for a rebuild now, as opposed to saying, you know, let's go get Andy Dalton and see what happens? So, looking at their contracts, I could easily argue they're rebuilding right now. They're in rebuild right now. Um, I would say you can't tell them that. Yeah, I know, right? Well, they gotta sell tickets, right? They gotta sell tickets yeah. and stuff. So um I would say 80% of your contracts, they're not lasting past this season. So you guys are gonna only have 25 players under contract in 2022. 25. So that means a lot of a lot of maneuverability as far as cap space next year, or yes. what does that mean? Yeah. It does. Uh, so ba a lot of your guys are either going to be unrestricted free agents. You do have some exclusive right free agents, which basically means that the club is exclusive right. Uh, the club is the only team that can negotiate with them. And it's really usually a very low tag number, like usually in the hundreds of thousands. Um, you also have some restricted free agents. But I mean, for the most part, I mean, so let me we can break it down position group wise. Uh, running backs. The only running backs you'll have on your con on the team after this season are Cohen and Montgomery. Uh, wide receivers. The only ones you'll literally the only ones you have after this year are Ridley and Mooney. Those are the oh, only good. guys you have. Right um, now, like I said, you have Adams, <laughs> Reggie Davis. I don't even know half these guys. Horstead, Ives, Weed, Jordan Patterson. Mm -hmm. uh, not Jordan Patterson, but those guys are exclusive rights free agents. But like the team can easily just buy. Um, yeah. your Cole Komet is your only tight end, pretty much. You got Darian Clark, but he doesn't see, he barely makes any money, so wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, exactly. I mean, and then looking at your offensive line, you have three guys out of like 15 that are gonna be up, no, two guys that are gonna be on a contract next. So, you this team could be a completely different team next year. Is now that being said, is that maybe why? 
they decided to go all in with the same coach, the same GM, maybe get an, a slight upgrade at quarterback and just say, listen, we're, we're going to be clearing these guys out at the end of the next year anyway. Why don't we just see if we can position ourselves and make another playoff run? Even if we don't make a deep playoff run, let's just keep these bad contracts on the books now and make a run at it. Because like you said, most of these, a lot of these guys will be off the books uh, come 2022. Right. Absolutely. Either that or they're just duping everyone to think they're doing that and they really want draft capital. Ah, <laughs> that, that could be that could be that could be a, a good possibility as well. Although, you know what, you know what, Jason, I'm, I'm tired of thinking this. The Bears are duping anybody. We are so often the duped that we can't. That we're, I'm never no, going to give them the benefit know, of the Listen, doubt. As a Cowboys fan, we got Super Bowl every year, <laughs> even if we we're one in fifteen the year before. We're Super Bowl, yeah. we're Super Bowl contenders the year following. So yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, but, I, I mean, even if they have, at least you guys have those expectations. At least some Cowboys fans have those expectations. Bears fans are right. just like, how how are they going to screw us this year? So it's like it, it, there's well, just like that that mentality, I guess. Right. Well, one thing the Bears can be doing is if they could be trying to position themselves. Um, I mean. I don't know if anyone wants to hear this, but maybe still thinking about Deshaun Watson. Um, just maybe just keeping that, you know, on the side burner for a little bit, see how that, you know, starts to progress or whatever. Um, but they could be positioning themselves to possibly maybe try to make a trade for somebody. Um, you know, uh, Teddy Bridgewater isn't really the happiest of a guy. Like, I understand, look, is he a sexy name? No, but you guys have a really good defense. Um, you guys have a pretty defense pretty decent offensive line. Uh, David Montgomery is an up and coming running back. I like David Montgomery. I don't know how you guys feel about him. I like him. him. Right. Exactly. So, and um, with a Rob coming back um, and we will talk about, you know, how the tag plays a a role in all this, but you know, with him coming back, you know, um, you know, it it could be something to try to entice a guy to come over. And then like, you know, like we're saying for the year following the fact that they don't have any, like I was looking, I think as of right now, they have like $45 million in cap space. So, I mean, you could easily – look, I'm not going to lie. If I was a Bears fan, I would want you guys to suck this year. I'd want to suck this year so bad and just get, like, a top five <laughs> pick and get a new quarterback and then just use all this these extra resources to get help for that quarterback. Like, then you can sign A-Rob to a long deal. Go get another guy next to him. Like, for example, Michael Gallup. I don't know. You know what I mean? Give him $11 million a year. Put him right next to A-Rob. You know, and you can start – and your defense is already good. So, you mm-hmm. can – all you have to do is add a little – like sugar and spice to that defense. You know what I mean? You really don't need a lot. You have a good foundation there. So, th- I mean, there's a lot of ways you could go with this Bears team. And, and you, you kept mentioning uh, uh, Allen Robinson, and I, I want to talk about him because the Bears did sure. put the fl- franchise tag on him. He did end up signing it, and maybe that was just because the market wasn't what he thought it was going to be in free agency for wide receivers, and he's going he's gonna to make his money on the franchise tag. Looking – at what the franchise tag actually does to a salary cap. Is that a big detriment to a team that already had limited cap space going into 2021? As far as everyone in Chicago would like to see an extension for Allen Robinson. He does sign the franchise tag that does, you know, guarantee that he'll be on the team next year. But what does that really do to the salary cap uh, as far as this year goes, if they're trying to make any other kind of move? Well, uh, he's a, he's a almost a seventeen point eight million dollars guaranteed on the on the uh, on the cap. So, um, unless you were to trade him, then that whole entire number would come off. Like you, there'd be no dead money tied to it, nothing like that. It would all just come off and go to the other team. Um, being that's only seventeen point, I say only seventeen point eight, but um, and you know, I really don't think of it as that bad, that big of a deal. Uh, the only reason being is because, like, again, 17.8, one year, you can probably flip a few switches on guys. And when I say that, I mean restructure a few contracts. It probably it, it would probably take one, two, maybe three to restructure. If you were really, really, like, like you guys only have, what, $2 million in cap space. So um, they, probably, they probably had to uh, – they had to cut Kyle Fuller. They had to flip a few switches in order to make that happen. But with 17.8, like, there, there are ways to make it happen. So – I don't think it's that big of a deal, to be honest. But what it does is now his floor is $17.8 million a year. Actually, he could even play harder ball like Dak did and say, I don't think you guys are going to tag me again. I don't think you will. And then say the Bears like, okay, we have to tag him again. Well, now you increase this 20%. So it's going to go up to like, what, $22 million about roughly? Um, Now that becomes his new floor. 
Now, if you want to do yeah. any kind of deal, that's new. now he's like, okay, it's going to be at least $22 million a year. <laughs> oh, and I can't imagine the Bears going that way. Uh, but like you said, 17 and a half could be the new floor for Allen Robinson. Uh, if they're going to try to get an extension done, which, like I said, everyone in Chicago wants to see. I think Allen Robinson wants to see. We're still we're trying to figure out why that hasn't happened, but t- time will tell. And I don't who whether it's going to happen this season, next off season, or he walks next season. We'll see. Uh, but the, the everyone was talking about the potential of a sign and trade that they could potentially do with Allen Robinson, where they, he signs his franchise tender and then they they trade him. I wanted mm-hmm. to talk about some of the other players on this team that are tradable when you look at their contracts. Now, the, the first name that kind of came to my head might have been Akeem Hicks. Uh, it looks like yep. he might not be yep. going anywhere, but that could be the most movable. When you look over, because I don't think that no one, first of all, no one's going to trade for Robert Quinn, let, let alone take on that contract no. and all the dead money that comes along with it anyway. Uh, but if, who, if you look over this roster, if they were going to try to free up some space, who's the most tradable and who, who can, what can they save the most on? It, it actually is Akeem Hicks, believe it or not. Mm. And it's funny you say that. Um, he's in the, and actually what makes him really intriguing is he is in the last year of his deal. So uh, a team, I mean, they could just extend him. I wouldn't do it personally because then they would be on the hook for it, but they can extend him. But he's, I mean, he's only $10.4 million base salary uh, for a guy of his stature. That's pretty cheap. Um, so any club that would sign him, uh, just so everyone knows, basically when that's club of a team is trading for someone for the most part, the number you look at is their base salary. Try not to look at the cap number because the cap number is going to take in consideration like signing bonuses, any kind of restructure bonuses, workout bonuses. Um, and there's also like a dated bonuses and everything like that. Whereas if, when you trade the player, uh, usually the team that guarantees those money is on the hook for it. So you always want to look at the base number. So again, him here, ten point four million dollars. I, mean, I would love for the Cowboys to trade for this guy. Yeah. Uh, so if the Bears were to trade him, how much are they, would they? I mean, I don't. You probably don't have the numbers in front of you, but they they could be on the hook for some of that money. Then I assume then, right? Only one point five million. Oh, so, so they they'd would be clearing... save eleven and a half, ten and a half million, ten and a half million. It, but but when you're if, when you're with a franchise that said we want to win now, you don't trade away one of your de- best defensive players and say you're going to free up cap space. And then like, but we're still going to win now. And another defensive player, and I know this is this might be a, this might be a, a question that might set you off, but another defensive player they had to get rid of was Kyle uh, Fuller, and that yes. obviously was a salary that was a salary dump. But if you ask a lot of people who maybe not don't pay attention or they do kind of pay attention, they say the salary cap's a myth. You can do whatever you want. Sign whoever you want. Go at it. It's all a myth. It, it, the salary cap's not real. I need oh to boy. ask you, Jason, oh tell, me if the salary, tell me if the salary cap is actually a myth. No, it is not a myth. It is obviously <laughs> – Playing here, look, we, you had to cut Kyle Fuller because of it. Like, there were players who were cut. I have a question cap casualty. Mm-hmm. That word, that word just means nothing, right? They just made it up for no reason. <laughs> it's not real, right? <laughs> but here's my thing, and here's what I always ask people. And I get, I get how people think the cap is a myth because you know, look, I compare the cap to taxes. Taxes are real, right? You can manipulate the heck out of taxes, right? Same thing with the cap. But the thing is, and there's only, and here's the thing with taxes, the same way, there's only so much manipulation you can do before they're going to audit you. And in the NFL, you just don't get audited. You just can't do it. That's all. But so, like, I understand everyone's like, well, look at the Eagles. Look at the Saints. Well, the Saints were also like, what, $100 million over the cap this year. And I get it. And the reason why I guess people think that, you know, the cap is is kind of more of a myth because they hear about how players restructure and, you know, you can do all this other stuff. And, 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 and also I don't think people understand also what restructuring is as well. Um, I see a lot of, uh, like, you know, comments back and forth where they'll be like, Oh, the guys do the team a favor and take a restructure. And all they're doing is literally taking money from the left pocket and putting it in the right pocket and using accounting terms. That's it. That's all they're doing. So let's say a guy makes $11 million and they want to restructure 10 million of it. All they're going to do is take his $11 million bonus, his $11 million base salary, take $10 million of it, turn it into a signing bonus, and then prorate that signing bonus over the rest of the year of the contract. Why would a player not do this? It right. gives them more money it, in their pocket right from the beginning, right up front. They're getting more money. And on top of that, it actually adds 
more stability, I guess you could say, because they're adding dead money to his contract now. So, and then, and then another thing, like when people see these restructures, it opens up all this space and like, Oh, teams can just do whatever they want. Yes. You know what? The Cowboys every year, the bears every year could flip switches and get a hundred million dollars in space. No problem. They could do it every single year if they wanted to, but guess what? There will come a year where they're going to have to pay the piper and nobody wants to hear that. No, everyone thinks it's fake. Cause here's, here's, here's the point everyone brings up. Salary cap goes up every year. Granted it does, except for this one because of COVID understandable. However, there's also what I like to call natural cap inflation because you have guys, guys aren't, this isn't the NBA where guys get flat contracts. They go up, they go down, they do all that stuff. They fluctuate. So if players salaries are going up naturally because of a contract, well, now you're injecting artificial inflation because you're restructuring now. So I know I went to and, a lot of stuff. But. No, and, and I'm and uh, I'm sorry. I have a follow up question on that real quick. Yeah, no worries, man. When, when these when these it. guys when these guys add, what the hell is a void year? Because when I when I hear about okay. those kind of things where they where they add these void years where it's like, oh, we signed a six year deal, but really it's only a four, but like two like of those Dax are deal? void years. Yeah, uh, yeah, basically, <laughs> yeah. So whenever, yeah. whenever you hear it, whenever you hear these players like, oh, I think even uh, I think Danny Trevathan on the Bears has some void years on his contract mm -hmm. where it's it's like, well, so what does that mean exactly? Because you hear that and it's like, well, it's not really a four year deal. It's more of a two no. or it's not a six year deal. It's more of a four. But there's void. Right. year. What does that mean? So basically what it does is those void years allow a team to spread over the signing bonus over more years, which lowers the cap hit. So if I can spread it, like, let's, let's talk about that. We all, everyone love that deal. The, that was the biggest issue with the Cowboys is they wanted him to sign a five-year deal. So they had more, year, more years to spread the money over. So let's use a hundred million dollars to make it nice and easy. Five years over hundred million dollars would be twenty million dollars signing bonus every year. So that, that would, so his minimum cap hit would be twenty million dollars. When you and then you also have to add in his base salary. So basically, what it did was instead of now it being twenty million dollars, but now let's say that this is you seven years to add two years to it. Now they take that same hundred million dollars and instead of spreading over five years, now they're spreading it over seven years. But the last two years of the contract, he's not going to be on. Like they're they're just dummy. Honestly, they're placeholder years for the for the signing bonus money. And the clubs will still have dead money as a result of it, but it's just now it gives them more years to spread it over. That's all. Accounting. It's accounting. Yeah. <laughs> so e even after that player is gone, they are they are accounting for some of their, I guess, salary of that contract, right. despite the fact that they're not even there. Right. So the thing with Dak that makes it a little different here is what the Cowboys are hoping is the Cowboys are hoping, okay, we hope to extend him before that those void years kick in. So now – the new the new uh, CBA money is supposed to be coming in. I don't know if you guys heard, but the salary cap is going to go up ridiculous in like two mm -hmm. years, probably like fifty million dollars at least. Um, so what? So now what they're just hoping is they're hoping to get a deal done before those void years kick in to kind of get rid of. Them. But you, that's that's a risk. That's a risk you're taking. Yeah, and, and so it's like, well, you could be on the hook for something that you're not even using anymore. <laughs> but right. uh, that that that's 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 kind of the the risk, like you said, that you take. Uh, Alyssa, I got to kick it over to you. Uh, I know there's some questions that you wanted to ask, Jason. What do you got? Yeah, definitely. And you know, Jason, we can't you know talk about the salary cap and not talk about the Bears' quarterback situation with right. not only Andy Dalton but Nick Foles. So, just how good or bad uh, are those are those contracts with Dalton and Foles? They're actually really good. I'm not going to lie. You guys are paying the, – what they're getting paid is two backup salaries. Like, I'm not kidding. You guys are paying two backup <laughs> They don't have a starter. <laughs> no, yeah. but you don't have a starter. Between the both of them, though, makes, they, I don't even know if they make starter money between the both of them. I don't know. Seriously, I think it's like – between the both of them, it's like an $11 million cap hit. So, I mean, yeah, it's nothing. And then the year following, you can easily get out of uh, Nick well, – what's his name isn't even going to be on the team next year. He, he doesn't have a oh. deal. Um, yeah, Dalton, Dalton, he has actually him, void yeah. years. He has two <laughs> void years on his contract. Now that you bring it up. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, uh, where are they? Here they are. Yep. Um, yeah. So basically what's, so I hate to, I hate to do this to you, but just go back to the void year thing. He's not going to be on the team next year and he's going to be on the hook for, he's going to be on your books for $4.6 million. It's going to be a ghost. You're paying a ghost. I call it anyway. Um, but going back to the contract. Yeah. Uh, between oh. the both of them, it's not even $15 million. Uh, Nick Foles, you can save $7 million cutting him next year. He's only a $10 million cap hit. I, I mean, I honestly think 
backup quarterbacks are making more than that. So, um, yeah, you're. I think you're in great position when it comes to your quarterbacks. You, you you're not tied to anything long term. Well, just the contract. We don't have starters. <laughs> having a quarterback, yeah, that's a little bit of a problem. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, let me ask you this. I mean, I, you hear Sam Darnold might be available. I mean, how would you guys feel about a Sam Darnold? I mean, it's it's a nice thought. It's just that it, it, as Bears fans, we're so used to retreads where it's just like, oh, this guy showed some promise in another team. I bet the Bears can fix him. Or, oh, this guy, uh, you know, same Foles had success in Philly. Uh, Dalton had moderate success in Cincinnati. They they went out. I mean, we can go 20 years back where it's just like, oh, Cordell Stewart played pretty well with the Steelers. Let's see. Let's give him a let's give him a contract with the Bears. Chris Chandler's 100 years old, but he went to the Super Bowl with the the Falcons. Let's let's bring him in. It's it's always it's always these retreads. Uh, I, uh, Jason Campbell, I think, after he was in Washington, came over and played a year with the Bears. Mm-hmm. So uh, so yeah. So it's just I, I think the Bears. And Bears fans would more like a homegrown. That's what. That's why I think everyone wanted Trubisky to work out, even though they didn't love the guy. Or they didn't love his skill set. They loved the guy, and they wanted it to work out because he'd be a homegrown quarterback. Uh, but uh, it's just, it's just Sam Darnold sounds good to on the surface, but I just don't think the Bears fans are gonna. The Bears fans are gonna be pissed off regardless. It doesn't really matter. But yeah. it, that. Exactly. But to your to your point. They got two great contracts if they were if they were backups to somebody else. Like if they like right. if they if they had an established yeah. starter, the quarterback position or the backup position. Because I think they were paying they were paying Foles or they were paying Chase Daniel almost which as much as they were paying Nick Foles. So uh, it's, so it, yeah, on the backup side, yeah, the contracts are great. The problem is we have two backups right now, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, I digress. Alyssa, continue. <laughs> And I was going to say, I think Bears fans would be okay with, with you know, going and paying, you know, a quarterback a substantial salary because it would mean that you have a franchise quarterback. But, right. You know, <laughs> which, so you know, Bears you fans guys, really dream at this point. Were you guys, like, praying Dak was going to become a free agent? Oh, absolutely. We were, yeah. Yeah, we, we were, <laughs> yeah. That would have been perfect. That, that would have been great. And so, so, But once again, you, they, they have to move things around to pay the guy. But. Yeah. You know that's that well, that would be uh, that would be possible, uh, uh, Alyssa. You were I think I think you were going yes, down I'm that so sorry. vein of yes, yeah. No, you were going down that, <laughs> that vein of the future of this team. So please let's 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 talk yes. about the the misery in the future. Oh yes, and, and I know we t- you, we talked a little bit about Jason about the twenty twenty two and what what that kind of looks like with the Bears only going to have twenty five guys uh, under contract at that point. So you know, looking ahead to twenty twenty two, I know many Bears fans are hoping that they have a new GM and a new head coach. You know, what exactly right now does the twenty twenty two salary cap look like for Chicago? So, like I said, you only have about twenty five guys that are under contract, and then as of right now, I mean. Judging the cap, the cap would be about $192 million, which I'm going to guess is going to be a little higher than that next year. You're at $43 million in cap space next year. So, so quick, let me just interject real quick. If there is a new GM and there is a new head coach, I think a lot of people were worried that the new GM, new head coach were going to be hamstrung with a lot of contracts that they could not move. You're saying that isn't the case, though. If they were to get a new GM and a new head coach, they actually can mold things the way that they would want to mold it then, correct? Yes, sir. And then, uh, like I said, you June one, uh, Robert Quinn, you opened up another what eleven million dollars. We said before, or something like that. So we're now we're at what fifty five million about. I mean, hey, I can start cutting money right here real fast and get you guys really excited. So, yeah. can you be um, our new GM, please. Yeah. Are, are you? Do you have your resume updated? We we would like to submit that to uh, Hallis Hall if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> sure, I will, I'll do it for free. How about that? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> We I'll love saving money in Chicago. Yeah. He's gonna, the first thing he's going to do is trade Akeem Hicks to Dallas. <laughs> yeah. He's going to Dallas. Well, no, next, year, the next year, he won't be on the team, though. That's true. He's, uh, yeah. He's, yeah. He'll be, he'll be, um, he's the he's, We're, we're yes. going to fire Pace midseason. How about that? Yeah. yeah. There, there we go. go. There we go. <laughs> what, that, one more question before we get you out of here sure. is, um, if the Bears were going to go and trade for Russell Wilson, or they were going to maybe go sign Dak if he became a free agent, or they did sign for Deshaun, or they did trade for Deshaun Watson. And you mm-hmm. look at the Bears' salary cap issues, you think, well, how the hell could they possibly take on that contract and and whittle their way under the cap? Uh, are there ways to? in the moment or by the time they have to get under the cap where they would bring in a Russell Wilson contract. And then how do they get, they, 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 would they have to restructure him or do they have to do a lot of, like you say, flip the switches on a lot of other guys to get underneath? 
No, uh, and the reason why, first of all, if you were to trade for Russell Wilson, I uh, his contract is, if memory serves, because of course I was looking when uh, so everyone started bringing him up with uh, the Cowboys. His yeah. contract is extremely trade friendly. The only reason why it wouldn't happen is I believe that um, the Seahawks would get about a $39 million dead money hit. So I yeah. don't think they want that very much. Um, but, you know, his deal is uh, – I'm actually pulling up right now as we speak. Um, yeah, so uh, if you just give me like two seconds, I can tell you. Yeah, you would only be paying Russell Wilson $19 million this year. Well, that that'd be fine because I'd, I'd be fine with because what I mean that's 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 uh, barely what Dalton and Foles combined are making, right? <laughs> as far as oh, it's a little bit over. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, putting this in perspective, I mean, Dak. I mean, at that point, I mean, Dak Prescott is getting more in base salary than nineteen million dollars. So, and then the year after that, he's nineteen million again, and then the year after that, he's only twenty-two million. So. Well, that makes it hurt a little bit more, Jason. So I appreciate you doing that. Uh, just go ahead yeah, and throw no salt in our uh, throw Sorry, and throw no, salt in. No, no, no. <laughs> no you, you, you kept it. You kept it real with us, and I, and and I and I certainly appreciate. It. And this, honest to God, this has been. I've learned so much in the, in this last <laughs> twenty minutes about the salary cap and what's happening. So I, I, I gotta I gotta say that we're probably gonna be in contact with you again to break down some more salary cap oh. stuff through through down the road. But uh, before we get you out of here, uh, please tell us what you got going on, how people can uh, see your work, and how they can interact with you on social media anything you want to plug go ahead let it let us know how because i think a lot of people that listen to this they're going to want to they're going to uh they're going to want to know more from you and they you might yeah. be getting you might be getting dms from a lot of bears fans so uh, no go, go ahead how, dms how are always open you? no that's nice. right i love i know it's so geeky man i love talking about this stuff but it, you know, I mean, someone has to do it right um yeah no uh yeah <laughs> you can find me at dynastyfootballfactory.com um dffj waltner on both twitter and the gram uh and then uh capology 101 uh small hiatus but we are picking it up back very soon uh we're going to be partnering up with uh, dynasty vipers on that so keep an eye keep a lookout for that as well and uh that's pretty much about it we'll be on spotify you um itunes all that great stuff Awesome stuff, Jason. Thanks you. Thank you so much for being on Buffone Fifty Five, oh, breaking no down the bear salary cap uh, situation. We love this. We appreciate you being on the show, and I guarantee we'll talk to you down the road, Jason Waltner. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much for having me. We'll be right back with more Buffone Fifty Five right after this. On the latest Draft on Tap, Mark Schofield of TouchdownWire.com evaluates the tape on New Bears quarterback Andy Dalton. Mark also tells us if Texas A&M quarterback Kellen Munn is a scheme fit for Matt Nagy's offense. Plus, Danny Shimon and Neil Stopchinski share their scouting reports on this year's top interior defensive linemen and whether the Bears should pursue any one of them. All that and more on the latest Draft on Tap, which you can find on the Barroom Network's YouTube channel. Welcome back to Buffone 55. The guests just keep rolling in. Joining us now, he's a podcaster and writer for Windy City Gridiron and runs the popular Run Pass Option channel on YouTube. We now welcome Robert Schmitz onto the program. Robert, how you doing? Appreciate you being on, man. I'm doing well, man. It's exciting to get to be on the channel. I've been following Barroom's work, I mean, since I've been a Bears fan. So when I got the chance to join with Windy City Gridiron, let alone get on this podcast, I mean, it's a huge honor. Thanks so much for having me on. And the check is in the mail. We appreciate you saying that. <laughs> uh, but the, the the reason I wanted to bring you on is because you did a great breakdown and you, you know a lot about the new QB1 in Chicago. <laughs> and I, I guess I'll use the air quotes there. The QB1 coming back uh, into Chicago, Andy Dalton. He's going to mm -hmm. be uh, allegedly the starter going into 2021. I want to start off real quick with, Let's reverse the clock a few weeks. When you heard that the Bears signed Andy Dalton, 
what did you know of him? What was your reaction initially whenever you heard the news? Well, I'm going to be really candid with you. So when we originally started hearing that Andy Dalton, the Bears were in on him, I was just not allowing myself to believe it. I was like, no, Andy Dalton's a living meme. There's no way the Bears are going to do this to me in the 2021 offseason. We're getting Russell Wilson or we're not, but I'm enjoying thinking about it. So I'm just going to meditate and manifest it. And then the deal comes through. $10 $10 million, we find out it's stretched over two years for Andy Dalton, who was ranked in most metrics to be the 28th best quarterback last year, which is weird. Obviously, he was a backup, but it's not exciting either way. And the Bears suddenly have the red rifle, where the best two things you can say about him are that he's got a phenomenal gift game on Twitter and his orange hair fits the Bears uniform perfectly. But outside of that, I then got into the film, and I won't spoil anything. I know we're getting there, but I have to start off by saying I was as disappointed as anybody else. Kind of still lingers. I'm not about to pretend to you guys that the Bears have oh, secretly one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. This is not that show. But I do like to think no. that I can shine some light Never. on what he does well because they exist. He wouldn't be this long in the NFL if he couldn't do some things well. And what you shouldn't expect to see coming up this next season <sighs> kind of sounds like everything's awful uh but since depends since, on uh, your perspective <laughs> yeah everything's relative but since you've had some time to really get into the film to understand what dalton's i guess strengths and most likely his weaknesses are sure. uh, i want i want to go through some specific skills and kind of see yeah. how he stacks up against what bears fans are used to saying so seeing so let's start off with decision making that was a mm-hmm. knock on Mitch Trubisky throughout his tenure in Chicago they thought Nick Foles could process things a little bit quicker but he couldn't get the protection he needed I guess so how does Andy Dalton's decision making kind of compare to that of Foles and Trubisky so first of all to any barroom listeners that haven't heard on my channel one of the co- most complicated things about talking about decision making is that most people have looked at Mitch Trubisky to be their example of what a bad decision maker looks like and then all of a sudden I mean I swear this guy's making 3 4 reads against the Detroit Lions like how's this guy a bad decision maker he just scored four, 30 40 points in a row for like 4 weeks in a row what's the deal the most complicated thing about talking about Trubisky is that against like average and above defenses he's a very different quarterback than against below average and below defenses where honestly if we could get that Mitch Trubisky every single week in terms of what he visually looks like as well as how accurate he is and so on and so forth he he would still be a bear I think we can all agree with that I mean when Mitch is playing Jacksonville when he was playing Houston Detroit even kind of early in the season especially that fourth quarter he's a dynamo it's the other games where things kind of fall apart but enough about Mitch I would imagine that if your show is anything like mine, he's been talked to death. We're going to talk about Andy Dalton. The weird thing about Dalton is that he is really, really good pre-snap and post-snap. He struggles a little bit. I get the impression from watching him that Andy Dalton makes almost his entire decision looking at the defense. And I've been watching a lot of Gardner Minshew, too. I watched a lot of other quarterbacks. But Gardner Minshew is one that I know Bears fans talk about as, well, this guy's got really good stats. What's going on here? And it was funny watching him because he gets frozen by any coverage that switches from a one-high set to a two-high shell or a two-high shell to a one-high set where those rotations, exotic coverages that I know Bears fans saw Chuck Pagano attempt to deploy for the last two years. Those sorts of things will freeze a lot of young quarterbacks, not Andy Dalton. He actually picks those up pretty well and isn't phased by it. The trouble is, and if you go and watch any Andy Dalton like meme reels or interceptions, so on and so forth, you're going to see a lot of them thrown into double coverage. What's the deal here? Andy makes the assumption that his head fakes are going to take effect. And so when he knows what coverage is coming, he'll often point his head in a direction away from where he ultimately wants to go with the ball, reset, find his target, and just trust they're going to be there. They're going to have separation. He's your absolutely standard low-end starter in that case that he relies a lot on just 
trusting his receivers to be there. And sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. But the weird part is there are moments on film where you'll see that Dalton passed on, in one case against uh, Cincinnati, ironically enough, uh, with Dallas. He passed on a wide open touchdown because he assumed he would get the safety to bite and then switches over to CD Lamb. And he still rifles in a 22 yard gain, but obviously that's not six points and a 55 yard touchdown, even though if he had just looked at the safety, which he never bothered to do, he he would have seen that he didn't bite the fake and ultimately Dalton Schultz in that case was wide open. It's a really interesting, I won't call it a conundrum, but a film case for a young guy like me to watch because the difference between Dalton pre-snap where he really does know his stuff and post-snap where he's taking the safest option he can if he's confused and if he's not confused, he's going to probably try a short or intermediate throw. We'll get to his deep stuff in a little bit. It's It's been really intriguing. I think it's a net positive for the bears if the bears can ultimately scheme things or scheme things properly. But let's be honest, that's been a question now for the last two years after a 2018 season that had us all feeling pretty high. Scheming something to the skill set of the quarterback. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I know it's that. foreign I, concept, right? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like it. I don't, uh, it's, it's just something we don't do here, but, uh, <laughs> but you, you, you mentioned uh, some of the physical skills and that's what I wanted to talk to you about next was, the long ball is something that the Bears offense would love to figure mm -hmm. out. With weapons like Allen Robinson, you got the speed of Darnell Mooney. Yep. Uh, is there the possibility that we could see more long – well, I don't want to say long balls because we could see more. <laughs> could we see more long ball completions in, in 2021 with Andy Dalton? So, you know, it's funny that you said more. That makes it a relative question. Andy Dalton is one of the worst deep ball throwers in the NFL, generally coming in around like 24th, 25th. Mitch Trubisky and Nick Foles combined to be like 45th. So it, it was it was almost legendarily bad, as almost as bad as it get, could be in Chicago, where you got notable misses from Mitch Trubisky missing uh, Cole Komet on that wheel route at the end of Jacksonville. And just as much as you've got uh, Nick Foles missing Darnell Mooney in, what is it, the Tampa Bay game, just to pick two off the top of my head, there were a lot of them. And we know that because Darnell Mooney ended up clocking in on, what was it, like 22 deep attempts and only seven were catchable. So... Yeah, it's been rough in Chicago. In terms of the way that that plays out with Dalton, generally speaking, the question is how deep. If you're talking the 20-yard to 30-yard region where he doesn't have to put a lot of air on the ball, he's pretty accurate, especially for guys that are wide open. I never saw on film somebody wide open that Dalton saw through to and didn't get the ball to. And I saw a couple of like tighter window completions. And hey, I saw two 50-plus yard touchdowns, which the Bears haven't had for two years. So that's awfully neat. But this is a low bar. Like Dalton yeah. will tell you, it's not an arm strength thing. I think it's just that he hates his touch throw because he won't use it if he doesn't have to. Anything 30 yards or under, and I'm talking literal yards. Don't get out your protractor. This isn't geometry. Like if you take everything under that 30-yard bucket, that's his preferred throwing range. And he can hit guys in stride. It's it's hit and miss as, or as any very mediocrely accurate quarterback can be. Because in case you were wondering, the data says, says that his expected completion percentage difference from what the computer says should happen was zero last year. Most players are positive in the NFL. Dalton is net zero. So he is exactly as accurate as he's supposed to be putting him around like 23rd in that category. And you'll see a lot of those even short and intermediate balls that are just, they're behind the guy, they're in front of him, they're above, they're too far, they're too low. And sure, you could say that about any quarterback that has a sub 100% completion percentage. But in Dalton's case, I just don't want to give any Bears fans the impression that, that this guy's laser accurate. They call him the red <laughs> rifle for a reason. He's, he's a West Coast quarterback. He wants to throw short. He's good at throwing short, but he's not perfect. And if he was, this wouldn't be his third team in the last couple of years. I'll be honest, Robert. You're not making me feel that great. Uh, <laughs> but um, but uh, I like that you're question, being completely wrong. The question is how bad you think the quarterback situation has been. Ch chances are we're not going to beat up on bad teams. And, I mean, it doesn't help that we don't have almost any on the schedule. The New York Giants have invested in free agency. Cincinnati, you never know. This is year two of the Burrow era. So hopefully we beat Detroit twice. 
Uh, and then we'll see because Minnesota, I mean, it's a coin flip about whether they get any better every year. I know I know that people try to sell the purple Kool-Aid almost every single year. And I just I don't know. The, the Vikings have always been pretty flavorless. But if you're expecting Dalton to be an all star, you're going to be disappointed. But there's a but on the end of this. He still might be better than both Mitch or Foles uh, on a general throughout the season trajectory. It's just if you think it's a low bar to clear, it is, in my opinion, anyways. So, yeah, I thought you I thought you guys said it well. In fact, I'll challenge one thing I said in the last segment. He talked about how there were two backup quarterbacks on the roster. I don't know if that's 100% fair, if only because I don't think that there are 32 starting quarterbacks in the league. Like, I get what he's saying. Andy Dalton's not impressive, but Daniel Jones has worse metrics, and is he a solid starting quarterback, or is he just young and, and we don't know yet, even though he's been the quarterback for the last three years. If you evaluate all the quarterbacks, Andy Dalton is a starter and I say that with an eye roll and a little <laughs> bit of attitude because it makes me sound like I'm defending a guy that is really good I'm not he's a standard Bears capable in other organizations we'll see if he fits in Chicago quarterback hopefully he impresses us hopefully Matt Nagy just turns into a savant or something you never know it's happened before where coaches have been handcuffed but I wouldn't hold your breath just yet yeah, and that's the thing. The bar was so low, and I think Bears fans are tired of just thinking, "Can we stumble over that bar incrementally?" I think right. they wanted to set they wanted to set a new high jump record mm -hmm. by going to get uh, Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson, or going up and trying to get uh, a top five pick, but that didn't happen. Now, this next question is is interesting because we're going to talk about the skill that kind of separated Foles and Trubisky last year. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about mobility. Yep. No one believes that Andy Dalton is Lamar Jackson. But I don't think he's Nick Foles either. You're How literally is... taking the words out of my article. <laughs> You're literally reading it. I mean, which it is was, great. It was weird watching or watching Dalton because you think to yourself, okay, so 33 year old former franchise quarterback. All the highlights that I've seen, because you know those game breaks that we get when we're watching Bears games. It's like Dalton throwing the long ball to AJ Green. Is it is it going to get caught this time or is he getting picked off? Those are all I've I've watched. But what you end up getting with Dalton is a whole lot of him pulling the ball down and running it for about four, maybe five yards and just sliding. He rolls out a lot. Like that same end of season offense where Mitch was rolling and he would pick between a short read, a middle read, and a long read and almost always pick the short read. Dalton could do that. He has the mobility and the toolkit to do that. And part of that, when I say Dalton's probably, if I had to project like the 16th, most mobile quarterback in the league. You got to remember Matt Ryan Aaron, or not Aaron. Aaron's actually fairly mobile, but like Matt Ryan, Tom Brady, those kinds of guys are in the NFL. Like Dalton is not Jared Goff. Dalton is not uh, Daniel Jones either. Who's surprisingly fast, but what Dalton can do is move around in the pocket. He keeps his eyes downfield fairly well. Again, if a receiver crosses out of that, like 25 yards downfield region, he's not looking there anymore. But if they're under, Underneath that, Dalton will do what he can with his legs. He doesn't take a lot of truly unnecessary sacks. May look that way on the broadcast sometimes, but honestly, the part about Dallas that a lot of people, at least in my opinion, aren't really talking about is that for as high build as C.D. Lamb, Michael Gallup, uh, Amari Cooper, and that Dallas receiving core was, they were not open all the time. It's not like they were bad, but the offensive line actually looked fairly similar to Chicago. So Bears fans, if you want to get a good sense for how Dalton moves in the pocket, you will get one because their offensive line looked right about as bad as ours did there in the middle of the season. But it's basically imagine you took Mitch and Foles and you fused them together. And that exact average, that's Dalton. We we made a Frankenstein of We Foles made Mitch Trufolsky. Wham. We, we actually Andy got Dalton. Mitch Trafalski and it is Andy Dalton. And after you merged them, his hair turned red and it came mm -hmm. and out came Andy Dalton. And that's, you know, another thing about Dalton and a lot of the narratives that came when, like whenever he came to Chicago was it's OK. Bill Lazor's here. You look at look at what, whenever he was with Bill Lazor. Look what he did. And now you look over his numbers and they're like, all right, they're they're fine. They're good. I mean, he had that probably he had some productive years. But I got to ask you. Does the Bill Laser connection really mean that much whenever whenever it comes down to what's gonna be we're gonna see on the field? 
Personally, all I ever think you should read into in terms of like coach knows or coach knows player relationships is what that player thinks of running a specific scheme. It's not necessarily laser knows how to get the most out of Andy Dalton, because I mean, just like we saw last year, I understand laser got, and I actually don't know y'all's opinion on it, but my impression from the coaches that I've talked to play calling, especially at the NFL level is such a, I'm going to use it terrible bears buzzwords so just hold your breath collaborative effort Ew. that when oh, when the God. bears turned things over for matt Nagy to bill laser chances are Nagy still had a lot of influence and of course bears fans were quick to recognize that anytime a play didn't work if it did bill laser must have called it if it didn't <laughs> screw matt Nagy. why is he still on the rock <laughs> or like why is he still the coach i get it but anyways all this really means to me like you take a look at ryan fitzpatrick and Jameis winston and the other coaches that have worked with bruce arians bruce arians runs like a full vertical offense that's basically just always trying to go downfield usually prescribes its reads and just needs accurate throws that are usually with high velocity into tight windows and receivers that are willing to make plays like that tom brady comes in they altered it great great it's sort of like a vert spread thing it's it different but the point is is that really all you should know about andy dalton and the bill laser connection is that this shows that he fits what the bears want to do whether they're going to be able to do it well i can't answer that because it's all going to depend on not only like do they fill at things at the offensive line in the draft can they add a wide receiver that can get open out of the three spot so on so forth but you should expect a lot of rpos you should expect them continue to try to get cohen and montgomery involved the same way that they have montgomery's gotten an awful lot of carries wouldn't surprise me if they want to take the load off of him a little bit i won't be shocked if they draft another running back not high like later in the draft to kind of play a similar role as Cohen or maybe a middle ground between them but the point is is that if I was going to look at the laser and Dalton connection it just means that the Bears want to get back to the more west coast west coast roots that they had in 2019 you know the the 202 offense and try to do it with a quarterback they think they can make it work with Nagy in his last year does not want to go down swinging with somebody else's offense and near the end of the season and actually at the start in Detroit and Newton New York they were running a more Shanahan-esque McVeigh a style system i get the impression that Nagy doesn't want to play copycat if his job's on the line that's horrifying in a sense uh <laughs> it's it oh, let's use the word that we should all be saying intriguing maybe yes. interesting like hey you know what wouldn't it be nice if we had a pleasant surprise like even though we've got a murderer's row schedule it would be neat if something worked out for the bears because you feel like they're due over the last couple of years but in the world of realism it's the hope that kills you, as the English say. And I, I'm i not expecting fireworks. Maybe a slow churn and 22 points a game. But remember, the average is closer to 25 now, which is weird. So we're just... We're just hoping to have a neat season. That's that's all. That's all we. That's what all we're going for. Best you can hope for is Andy Dalton. Surprisingly enough, is one of the more aggressive intermediate throwers in the league. He avoids the deep ball about as much as Derek Carr did back when he had that captain checkdown name. Not the 2021. He's right about there. And in fact, I looked up the numbers. 2016 Brian Hoyer threw deep. That's 20 yards and more more than Andy Dalton ever has. But what Andy Dalton does do, he's like top five in the league at throwing between 10 and 20 yards. So he's not just trying to keep the ball short all the time. He just doesn't want to go longer than he feels like he has to. So will this work for the Bears? Can they work with that? They obviously think they can, though let's be honest, guys, they've made every effort possible to say we tried to get Russell Wilson, don't blame us. So are right. they happy with Andy Dalton? I don't think that's fair to say, but I don't think that they're upset with him, which in and of itself, it could be somewhere between an indictment and just proof that they didn't have much to work with here. And I like to hope that we'll get the 24th best quarterback in the NFL, but like that's that's what we're shooting for here. And, and that's why I got to ask you just straight up. And we talked about this before and it, it's all relative and it's all compared to what the Bears fans are used to. Uh, but before I before I toss you over to Alyssa, who has questions, I just got to ask, in your opinion, how much of an upgrade is Dalton, at, if at all? And what is can Bears fans turn on a Bears game and not think, oh, man, this offense is putrid. Is there, is there, is there going to be an actual upgrade this year, in your opinion? 
Honest opinion, if the offensive line can hold its water, then the, that should help the running game out. And if the running game isn't awful, like the whole game doesn't fall on Foles or Mitch, or in this case now, Dalton's arm, you might not hate our offense. Now, you said everything's relative. I don't know how it's going to look against the Baltimore Ravens, for instance. Like, I don't know how it's going to look against the Cleveland Browns, some of the better teams in the NFL, let alone the fact that we get to visit the defending champs at the end of the season. So, thumbs up for that. Bet you will, bet you yeah, will be starting yeah, yeah. our second or third round pick, whoever that is, <laughs> in that game in an effort to save things. But I, let, I, you never know. You never know with football. You think Darnell Mooney might be something, and then like, wow, he's really something. And then you think Anthony Miller's going to be something as well, and he fizzles and apparently just doesn't put in the work. Like, it's football is such a game of guessing, but chances are we're not getting a ton of firework plays. We're going to have to hope and pray our way down the field. You're going to see a whole lot of RPOs, a whole lot of incomplete passes, a whole lot of tight receptions, and a lot of Andy Dalton. But whatever it is, my hope is that David Montgomery can get himself moving because, man, that guy is a freight train when he hits the three-yard mark. Like, once you get him that first three yards, gosh, he saws safeties and inside linebackers open. So – Maybe we'll get a more like West Coast mixed with old school Bears football if the running game can get off the ground. But I'm definitely not looking at Dalton as somebody that like is going to go out there and cover warts. You know what I mean? Alyssa, now that you're all inspired and feeling great about Andy Dalton, do you have any questions for Robert? <laughs> man, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, you know, man. It doesn't feel real good. Everything's awful. And I already expected that coming into this. So, I mean, Robert, you made it made me feel so much more worse. Did you expect but, me to say that he's no. as good as Kirk Cousins? Like, guys, we got this guy <laughs> off the street. We like, can't even get Kirk Cousins. Do you know what I mean? And somehow though? it's like, worse. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, it's, somehow you made it worse. There's this top 30 list of quarterbacks and I mean I'm almost excited that maybe we've got a guy I can call a starter instead of a guy who it was like hey he's he's been a backup his whole life but he's a Super Bowl MVP maybe that'll work out why but not so he's like, got a statue I know right right now we are our former quarterbacks were the guy being paid two and a half million dollars by the bills and the guy who the bears are trying to trade so that should tell you like I hope I'm hoping that Andy can bring some stability, but that's because if you're like me at all, I can't be too negative or I just get apathetic and sad. And so if I say that's the opposite me, of this show, we are always, aside from I all thrive, the, I on the I, I, I thrive on that. I thrive uh, yes, on the agony. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, quarterback durability specifically with Trubisky and Foles who they've had some of those durability issues over the last couple of years or so and even Dalton last year missed some time did do you, you that foresee hit? that being an issue oh, in 2021 did you see the hit Dalton took yeah. by the way oh yes. my gosh like <laughs> yeah. anybody anybody would have been lights out on that one and I was like I remember watching it like oh my gosh and then even worse the Cowboys players like didn't fight for him afterwards. Yeah. So it's just it's just a very standard Andy Dalton moment. Like watching Andy Dalton throughout his lifetime, I've I've seen more just weird stupid stuff. Like there's a play where he takes the snap, sets the throw to his left and just the ball comes out of his hand wrong and it goes about 4 feet behind him. So he just fumbles on the spot throwing, trying to throw a pass. He'll put right so in like, good. It, good. exactly. But so as far as, as far as as far as durability goes, his hands have been more a problem than anything else. So he I believe he tore a ligament at one point, uh making a tackle off of a pass that he had thrown an interception on. So if that sounds familiar to Bears mm. fans from what was it like twenty yeah. thirteen? It is. Mm. <laughs> but so at that point he dealt with a bruised wrist at one point. It's really all hand injuries. I was looking at that up before I came over here he's generally finished the season like he has I believe what is this nine seasons under his belt and he's finished six of them so it's way better than Nick Foles was at and um Mitch Trubisky I don't know like it's it's been weird looking at that because I don't think he finished either of the last two seasons though the last one wasn't fair because he got benched season before that he got hurt season before that he got hurt never major injuries but you get the idea my hope would be that Dalton is going to stay upright for all 16, 17 games. Um, but so 
At this point, I don't know. It's all a matter of whether we're going to be starting Tremaine Fady at right tackle. And if we can get more competition at those tackle spots, whether for if you could push Fady out, goodness, if you could replace both of Fady and Leno, I'm feeling pretty confident because I know that a lot of networks are really low on Leno. I don't know y'all's official stance. He is extraordinarily mediocre and he's paid at extraordinarily mediocre level. So you're getting what you paid for there. But the point is, is that if the offensive line looks as bad as it did in that middle season with Arlington Hambright or Alex Barr starting his first game, like Rashad Coward at right tackle, Andy Dalton's going to die out there. But if the bears can do better than that, maybe he'll stay up all 16 games. It's not out of the question. Woof. Well, thankfully, <laughs> Howard is now with Pittsburgh, so we don't well, have to deal with yeah. that anymore. My goodness. We had to deal with that way too long. They're talking themselves into it. They're excited yeah. about it. Steelers fans yeah, are amped. they are. I'm like, they are. watch it's help that. any game. <laughs> watch any game. I hate to be that guy. I know fans can kind of kick a player on the way out or over glorify him, but that is one, like, I have I have not seen a worse lineman in my time. I saw I saw it. Yeah, yeah, I was talking to Pittsburgh Pittsburgh fans are like finally some depth or this guy could be I'm like no, 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 no. We don't like, know why he started all those games. Don't take that as a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he has starting experience. That means nothing on the Bears <laughs> offensive line. Oh, no. And obviously, like, the big news this week was that the NFL switching to a 17-game regular season. So, And the Bears are one of two teams that had never had a 4,000-yard passer yeah. during that span. Uh, so I know that they're adding an extra year, an extra game this year, but will like Andy Dalton be the Bears' first 4,000-yard quarterback? If he plays all 17 games, it would be damn hard not for him to. And that's primarily because Nagy likes to throw the ball so much. I mean, if you take a look at Foles' yards per game, Foles is hitting like 220, and you may be like, what? Yeah, a lot of it came in garbage time. Like the Titans game, he piled up about 130 yards of after, let's call it after game yards, but they they count. So how will this look? Look, a lot of it also depends. I've talked about the offensive line. If the Bears can add a competent third receiver, that's going to give Dalton the chance to throw to Allen Robinson, who we know he's really good, even if he's playing on the tag. Darnell Mooney, he should be able to hit the open yards. And so if Mooney can stretch that out into six, 700 yards, just like he did in his rookie season, that'll be good news. The 17th game helps a lot. Mitch Trubisky's a couple times now been on like a 3,800 yard pace in 16. So if they can keep, or if Dalton can even just replicate that, you're looking at the Bears' 40 yard, first 4,000 yard passer with that 17th game asterisk. Yeah, I, 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 like you said, it would be hard for it not to happen, but would you be surprised if it didn't? No, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> Chances are Dalton's going to get COVID for a second time because, I don't know, he's just that kind of guy because he had it last season, missed two games, and end up at, what, like 3,700 yards with Bears fans going, he played better than I expected, but he still didn't break the record, so he fades into nothing. And, th- and that would be something the only 4,000-yard passer in Bears history is – Andy Dalton. Oh, how long did he play? One year. And not, <laughs> to, not to mention, so he, he could throw 4,000 yeah. yards and we could still lose probably 12 games in oh, that it means schedule. Nothing. I mean, that might be an indication that they're losing games if his yardage is going up because they got to they gotta play in from behind the entire time. And playing from behind, we don't have a slot corner at the moment. We barely have a second corner. And then at one, I'm talking about Trafant, which lets Trafant. alone the fact that Jalen Johnson just magically stopped playing press coverage after being so good at it for six weeks. Suddenly, six weeks later, ah, he's got shoulder injuries. I'm wondering when those actually started because yeah. I wouldn't want to talk about it either. Look, I don't know. The trouble here is that Dalton, especially if the Bears just invest, 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 invest in offense. You know what? I'm going to be I'm going to give you the most optimistic thing that I could say. The Bears could push for average and land like 19th, 20th. So that group that's like bad but not embarrassing. Because you know the group I'm talking about, that like last place group, the bottom five, where in a league that scores 25 and a half points per game, they're scoring like 16, 19, something like that. The Bears could do better than that, maybe, if it was a normal season. But again, we're talking like, I looked at the thing, let's count the Raiders. You're looking at 11 games that the 2019 Bear, or the 2020 Bears would have like, you can book a loss. Maybe they would have won one of those 11 games. Ironically, they did beat Tampa, but you know, transitive property, Bears Super Bowl champions. Right. Um, yeah. But so, like, 
I will see what happens. It's such a funny year where the Bears could get better and their record will still get a lot worse if things hold out like we expect them to with the schedule. Can't talk about it enough because when you've got that many nasty teams on your schedule, it's going it's to be a rough year. The bright side, if you're not a Nagy Pace fan, is that I don't think George follows the sport enough to care. Like an eight and eight team is an eight and eight team, and that means that a six and uh, six and eleven team is a six and eleven team. And saying "Ah, but our schedule was really hard" doesn't excuse the fact that you're eight and eight with an easy schedule. So chances are they'll be handed their walking papers unless, and I bet you guys already thought about this. Justin Fields or somebody like that slides to like ninth and the bears can get the okay to trade up. But who knows that at that point, we're just waiting for the draft and guessing. Yep. Shooting for eight and nine. That's, that's the, <laughs> that's, that's go. what we're going for. Uh, Robert, before we give you the boot, I want you to be able to tell our listeners how they can catch all your work and how they can sure. interact with you on social media. Cause you get, you do a great job on YouTube. Thank you do you. a great job with all your articles. Awesome stuff. People need to be reading it and watching it. Please let them know how they can see it. Thank you so much. So you can find me at windycitygridiron.com, spelled like it sounds. And I show up there. I'll try to let you know on Twitter. So the easiest way is to follow me at Robert K. Schmitz, because between my 40-hour-a-week job and writing Bears articles that are fairly in-depth, I can't really guarantee a schedule. But I put out what I can. You can find me on my YouTube channel at Run Pass Opinion, spelled like that sounds, where I will be, or I'm streaming here and there, talking about the Bears as much as I can. And throughout this weird offseason where I swear the Bears don't want to pick a direction, is it a rebuild? Is Russell Wilson still on the table and we don't want to let it go? Are we just riding with Dalton and we're going to try our best, Doug, on it? We'll see. We'll know after the draft. And I'm sure on this channel, as well as mine, plenty of Bears analysis all the way. 100%. He's a writer for Windy City Gridiron and runs the Run Pass Opinion Channel on YouTube. Robert Smith, thanks so much for being on Buffone 55. We're definitely going to talk to you down the road. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. We'll head down to Buffone's basement right after this. I don't mean any disrespect. He just didn't play that well. Not for a guy of his caliber. If they don't run the ball here, I'm going to vomit. I swear to God. I don't really have any recollection of that at all, but I guess perhaps I blacked it all out. You know, they won, but I'm, I'm going to be miserable all week because they stunk. Welcome back to Buffone 55, and we're going to jump right into the Buffone's basement segment where we'll be joined by Aldo Gondia. Aldo, get the Trisket crumbs out of your beard. Come join us. Let's talk about the Bears. How you doing? I'm doing well. Great stuff. Uh, both interviews, fantastic. Uh, this, um, I'm so glad that we're doing these off-season uh, Buffone 55s. We, we desperately need them, even though you got – you have no good news to report. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's They're therapy great sessions. To talk about. They, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is this is more this is more for us than it is for anybody else. <laughs> so the first thing that comes to mind, we're talking. Obviously, we keep talking about quarterbacks, and now the draft comes up, and we see what San Fran gives up to move up to number three, and I. It makes it difficult to think that the Bears can possibly crack into the top 10 or top 12 now to get a quarterback. So my question that I would want to send around the horn is, do the Bears or can the Bears even move up to get one of those five quarterbacks? We've been talking about they might be, you know, they might be able to get uh, Trey Lance if he falls to 12 or 13, or maybe Mac Jones will fall. But Mac Jones reportedly is, might be going at number three to San Francisco. And, you know, uh, Zach Wilson could be going to go number two to the Jets. And obviously, uh, Trevor Lawrence is going number one, which leaves Justin Fields and Trey Lance. And then the Bears are competing with all these other quarterback needy teams that they got to trade up with to try to, to try to make something happen. So, Aldo, we just brought you in, so I, I'll ask you. Do you still think that they can move up and get a quarterback? I think it's highly unlikely at this point. And the reason is, is that the team has so many needs and to trade draft assets at this point to move up to the first round and grab one of these guys is going to be uh, very, very difficult 
for this team to survive that kind of a transaction. And what I mean by that is you need offensive line help. You need a wide receiver help. You need uh, uh, you need now a cornerback. You need a safety. You need so much that you need the draft capital to find good players to put in there. You've got three six-round draft picks. What are the chances you, you'll find one starter out of those six-round picks? So I got I have a feeling that they're probably going to draft a day two quarterback and in the first round with that 20th pick they're going to go for a position of need the highest player on their board at either the cornerback position the wide receiver position or something like that I, I think they're in really big trouble when it comes to potentially moving up for one of those top five quarterbacks it's something that I wish they would do but I realistically don't see it happening. Yeah, you know, can they do it? Absolutely. But will they is another question. I agree with Aldo. I don't I don't see it happening at this point. I think that we saw that their potential splash move was to go out and get Russell Wilson, which didn't happen. So now they're on their fallback plan, which is to, you know, they brought in Dalton. They're going to I think they're going to draft a day two quarterback, groom him, maybe buy themselves some time. But, you know, also like Aldo was saying, there's so many needs on this team that beyond quarterback with those first two picks in round one and round two, there's so many different ways that they can go. I, I've, I'm hoping that Ryan Pace has learned his lesson and will actually draft a quarterback in the second round. Uh, but, you know, you, like he was saying, you know, offensive tackle, cornerback, safety, receiver, obviously. There are so many different needs on this team that at this point, if you're not getting Russell Wilson to go out and win now, you know, you're not going to trade up to get somebody that's not as proven, especially as we've seen Pace's track record in the past. So, mm-hmm. I mean, at this point, I mean, I would love to go get one of those top five guys for sure. But I just, at this point, all signs are pointing to no. But I mean, this isn't the first time that we've, you know, Ryan Pace is trying to make us believe something only to go out and do the opposite. So, I mean, we'll see what happens down the road here. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and at first, I weeks, months ago, I thought, okay, maybe they're gonna try. Once the, I guess, once the Russell Wilson thing went away, I'm like, well, their only option is to move up and get a quarterback. Now, their only option is to go up, sell, make a make a good trade capital package, and go up and get a, a quarterback in the first round. After seeing what San Francisco had to give up to move from what, what was it, twelve to three, uh, I don't see how the Bears are going to put together a package to move from twenty into wherever they need to go to get either Justin Fields, Trey Lance, or whoever might be left. Uh, so I think that's gone. Now, what I think they will do now is, like you guys said, a day two quarterback. Everyone knows who's been listening to this show and follows me on social media. I would love for them to take Kellen Mond, not because I think. And by the way, I need to clarify some things. I don't think Kellen Mond is the best quarterback in the draft class but when you look at where the bears are drafting they're and they're not going to be able to move up and get a and get a guy i think that kellen mond is a good quarterback to bring in and try to develop and let him sit a year behind an andy dalton and learn from nick Foles and all that experience that they have in the quarterback room kellen mond is a very athletic quarterback he has shown maturity he plays better whenever he's he's calmed down and he has a good running game We've, we they saw that at, at texas a&m and you see that He's good off play action. So mm-hmm. I think that he's a good developmental quarterback for that Matt Nagy system or whoever's running an offense after Matt Nagy get, potentially leaves after next year. But I think that he is a good developmental quarterback who has shown that he has matured throughout the time. And he had a great senior bowl, although we, we talked about that. And so as, as far as, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to take Kellen Mond over Trevor Lawrence. I'm not going to take Kellen Mond over one of those five guys we just talked about. But talk about... The Bears situation, by the way, when I retweeted that Kellen Mond video, some people are coming at me like, oh, because he can throw the ball far. That means he's a great quarterback. Never in my life have I ever said that in my entire, ever, ever. But whenever you look at what he brings to the table and you look at where the Bears are, what the Bears situation is, and what they can and cannot do at this point, I think that he's the best guy to go out and get and get on the, one of those, on the day two. They may have to reach for him at in the second round which if they were going to give up a bunch of draft capital to move up and get a guy anyway why not reach for a guy in the second round you're probably going to try to trade away that draft pick anyway trade away and get trade go ahead and get the guy in the second round who might be a third round draft you know might be a graded out in the third round or whatever the hell you want to talk about i just happen to like him so that's my that's my kellen mond rant uh so but i i agree with you guys that i think that the idea of the bears going up and getting one of these guys I don't know if they even have the the ammunition to make a package for that unless they're really going to start throwing players in and they're going to start throwing, you know, 
two, three first round picks and a player to move up to get whoever's left between Justin Fields and Trey Lance. And not to say that those guys couldn't be great quarterbacks, but now you're in win now mode. You're, are you really going to trade away, you know, rostered players right now? Are you really going to trade? And well, like you guys said, there's some needs. You get you could you could go out and you could get uh, an offensive lineman in the first round and then get your developmental quarterback in the second round and, and see where that takes you. Not to mention you have Dalton on the roster and Foles on the roster. So I, I, ju- I just don't see it. And, you know, it's 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 unfortunate because I thought that was going to be their splash move. But after seeing what San Fran had to give up, I don't see how it happens. Uh, but let's let's pivot off of this because we we're, there's plenty of time to talk about the, the quarterback woes in Chicago. I want to talk about some of the big news that came out of the NFL just this week. And, and if you're listening to this the day that this podcast comes out, it happened yesterday. And we're talking about the NFL expanding to 17 games, which means that that old eight and eight record's not going to be around anymore, Bears fans. You're either a winner or a loser. You're not you're not going to be able to hug the line anymore. You're not going to be eight and eight anymore. You're either going to be eight and nine or nine and eight, or you can be six and eleven, or you can be eleven and six. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you guys how you feel about the the seventeen game season. Alyssa, I'll start with you. I mean, anytime you're going to give me more football, I mean, I'm for it on that aspect. And then I know the players are definitely against it uh, because um, obviously there's a greater risk for injury and things like that. Uh, But I mean, I'm all for getting more football. I mean, especially now, I feel like since the Bears didn't have a 4,000 yard passer when we had that 16 game season, it kind of feels like a fresh slate a little bit. Like it's a clean slate. So maybe, maybe we needed 17 games to get it, which is probably maybe Andy Dalton is the first guy that gets that 4,000 yard season for the Bears. I don't care if there's a 17 game. I just don't want to hear it anymore. So, I mean, I'm all for more football and, you know, potentially just kind of putting that 4,000 yard passer thing to bed. (laughs) Yeah. I, uh, I feel like Alyssa, you know, an extra regular season game should be fun, although it could, in the case of the Bears, just prolong the misery of what could be a really, really tough season. And, you know, I do have a concern about player safety in this case. Um, I would have really have liked to have seen the 17 game season along with another bye week. I think that the players really will, would have appreciated that to let their bodies regenerate a little bit more. Uh, so not having that second bye week l- really leaves a bitter taste in my mouth. Um, you know, the NFL is being very hypocritical about player safety when they know full well that adding another regular season game. And yeah, people were saying, well, they're taking away a, a, a preseason game and adding this regular season. Well, that doesn't mean anything because we know what game of the preseason is being eliminated. It's the one where all the scrubs are playing. Uh, so uh, so it's that's not a good thing. More football is good, but uh, it, they, it also should have been a company accompanied by a uh, an extra bye week. Yeah, um, I don't want to hear the NFL talking about how the player safety is their number one priority anymore just because obviously it's not. It's and we all know it is all a facade. It's about making money and you're going to make you're going to make a lot more out of another regular season game than you are about that that scrub uh, preseason game that you talk about. So, uh, yeah, I, as a football fan, more football. Great. Uh, and I, you get another regular season game and they added that extra playoff spot. And, you know, week, I guess a week 18 may be very exciting. And I, I, obviously I, we get to see more football, which I'm excited about. Another aspect that I'm kind of excited about is something that I just mentioned before we, you know, we jumped into this was you're not going to be able to ride that eight and eight train anymore. Your coaches that are cling, clinging to, well, we didn't have a losing season and we've never had a losing season is you're either you either you either had a winning season now or you had a losing season now unless you find a way to tie mm-hmm. but but most for the, for the most part you either had a losing season or a winning season no more of this 8 and 8 we're on the cusp and we we jumped into the playoffs and 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 bears fans you know exactly what i'm talking about for you 8 and 8 8 and 8 that's not apparently 8 and 8's not a fireable offense well 8 and 9 might be it's, it might be harder to retain everyone with an eight and nine record as opposed to an eight and eight record because eight and nine means you had a losing season. Eight and eight means, well, you weren't a loser. You weren't really a winner. Let's give you another shot kind of thing. No, you win or you lose. I like that. I like the fact that there is now there's an odd there's an odd number of games. So there can, there can no they're no longer you can you be a 500 ball team. You you're either you're either you're a, like I said 
You either have a winning percentage or a losing percentage. That's one of my favorite things uh, about this. Uh, real quick, um, I want to talk to you guys about the state of the secondary with the Bears. Now that Kyle Fuller is gone, uh, the Bears, they go out, they uh, they get um, Desmond Trufant. They re-signed Artie Burns. They still have uh, Trey Roberson from the CFL, who they were really high on last year. Uh, Aldo, I'll start with you. What's your confidence level in this secondary, and do you think they actually use a relatively high draft pick on uh, on a cornerback? Yeah, it's beginning to look that way. It's just uh, I, I still can't believe that Kyle Fuller is not on this team. I, I, I'm really going to miss him. He's one of the best tacklers uh, as far as cornerbacks in the NFL. Uh, and, you know, he really, I think, would have thrived on Deshaun Desai's uh, defensive coordinator position because he would have brought a lot of that Vic Fangio type scheme that made Fuller. Uh, the Pro Bowl player, but uh, yeah, we it, it, there are going to be some cornerbacks that are going to be cut post June first, just like Jason was saying, that could help this team. Uh, there's definitely going to be some help coming in via free agency, so we'll see what happens. But there certainly needs to be a lot of work done. We need to uh, upgrade the competition. And first and foremost, right now, we need uh, Jalen Johnson, last year's second-round pick, to be a premier cornerback. He's got to be that number one guy. He's got to keep that shoulder healthy. And I see Alyssa nodding up and down. She was probably – I'm probably stealing her thunder when she was going to say that same thing. But, <laughs> but right, I mean, Jalen Johnson is is the key. We need a lockdown cornerback, and this second-year pro is, is being put – there's a lot of pressure being put on him. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's hard to feel confident about the secondary when arguably you release, sorry, when you release arguably the best player that was in the secondary. And now for the second straight year, you have to go out and draft a cornerback. Jalen Johnson really needs to step up. You know, even with, you know, Eddie Jackson and in, in, with the safeties need to step up. Like, it, it's just really hard. Like, Aldo, like you said, I'm very disappointed because Kyle Fuller was God, like he said, a great tackler, an emotional leader. Like he was everything that you want in a cornerback. And I was excited to see what he could do in Sean Desai's defense as well, because we saw that he had his best season with uh, Vic Fangio in 2018. And I was looking forward to him getting back to that. And now, unfortunately, we don't get to see that. We'll see him probably thrive, most likely thrive in Denver. But, you know, and kind of looking at some of the moves that they've made, you know, bringing in True Font, re-signing Burns and having Roberson. Again, they're, when you compare them to Fuller, it's they're none of them are upgrades. It's just really hard to feel confident about the state of the secondary. And then with Jalen Johnson, the injury thing, you know, he needs to stay healthy because obviously that was the concern. You know, it's going to be interesting <laughs> moving forward to see what they do. I could see them going cornerback in the first round, if their guy is there, uh, obviously I think they're going to go tackle or cornerback, but I could definitely see them doing that. They need to, uh, there's just a lot of questions in the secondary and I'm not really feeling as confident, uh, as I was before Kyle Fuller was released. Yeah. Yeah. One thing we hear about this bears culture. Well, you just lost one of your culture guys there. When you, and you look at some of the, as aside from his coverage skills, think about how many Kyle Fuller tackles and hits that we that we had talked about the next day or post game where they threw a flag, but you look you look on the replay and it was not a flag. He he was a vicious tackler. He he was also able to separate the ball from the ball carrier. That's something that they're going to miss. Uh, and you're hoping, I guess, as a Bears fan, that Jalen Johnson's trajectory is the same as Kyle Fuller's was, uh, where you, Kyle Fuller Kyle Fuller came along and they go out and they sign a uh, they sign a, a veteran to be that number that good number two piece like they did with uh, Prince of Mukamara, uh, and, and you you hope that you pair someone like Desmond Trufant with Jalen Johnson ascending now. Jalen Johnson's not there yet, so we're not sure if that's actually what's going to happen. Desmond Trufant has some of his own durability issues, and that's something you did not have to worry about with Kyle Fuller outside, I believe, one injury. Uh, he never he he was a very durable player, so that's something that you're going to miss as well. You hope that they they get they find something. Artie Burns, they had some high hopes for just because he was a former first round pick, and they, he didn't have to be the guy in Chicago. But he's coming off a real bad injury. We'll see if he can produce a little bit. I'm still wondering what they're going to do uh, at the nickel position. Uh, I guess they they like themselves some Kendall Vildor, or Duke Shelley, or whatever they're going to put there. Uh, I think that this this secondary is going to take a, a step back now. It has the potential to not. I'm not saying, oh, this team, this secondary is awful and it's going to be a weakness. I don't think. We thought 
it might, it, we thought potentially that the secondary was going to be a weakness last year. It turned out to be their strength because Quinn and Mack weren't getting to the quarterback and the secondary was making plays. So it actually turned into be a strength and that has the possibility of happening again. Uh, just losing Kyle Fuller though is, is devastating. It's, I, I, I hate it because I loved his style of physicality. I, I love just the, the kind of attitude he brought to the bears team and Jalen Johnson now, he doesn't get any more cushion years. He doesn't get ushered into the NFL anymore. He's the guy, and he's got to stay healthy, and he's got to be their number one because if, if Jalen Johnson goes down, then you got Jesmond Trufant with his own durability issues, and we might see what we saw with the tight end position a couple years ago with Adam Shaheen and Trey Burton where you thought it might be an adequate one-two punch, but neither one of them could stay healthy, and all of a sudden you had Jesper Horsett out there and J.P. Holtz out there running routes. And so if, if uh, Desmond Trufant and uh, Kyle Fuller – or excuse me, Kyle Fuller, I missed him already – but if Jalen Johnson uh, goes down at any period of time where they're both out, then you're relying on – Artie Burns or Trey Roberson or Kendall Vildor or Duke Shelley. And that could be, that could be bad real quick. So uh, I, I think that um, there's the, there, there's, there's a lot more questions there. there. There obviously, I think there's some potential that this could be a strength of the team. Um, but there's a lot of things up in the air uh, before, before we close things out, guys, I, I just got to do this because it's on our rundown. And I got to ask you uh, after, after listening to the two, uh, the two guests that we had on today, you know, we got a little bit of positivity there. Uh, so I got to ask guys, is everything awful? And Alyssa, I'll start, start with you. Pretty open-ended question. I'm not falling for any of that. I mean, everything is always awful as a Bears fan. I just, after free agency, it's just like everything. It was like, even though I knew that they weren't going to get Russell Wilson, it was like nice to be hopeful and optimistic. I mean, that's always the most hopeful that we are during the season is during the offseason. And then it was just kind of like one thing after the other. You know, Russell Wilson signing Andy Dalton, releasing Kyle Fuller, and it's just like... I mean, it's hard right now to feel anything but awful. So is everything awful? You, you bet your ass it is. <laughs> oh, no. You're always the yin to the yang here. Is everything awful? <laughs> well, as of right now, yes, because we've got two backup quarterbacks, but we don't have a real starter, and we're not going to have a starter in 2021. We may draft somebody. We may in a miracle trade up for one of the top five quarterbacks, but – Let's face it, Andy Dalton is going to begin the season as the starter at week one. Even if they end up landing a Trey Lance or a Mac Jones, it's highly likely it's going to be Andy Dalton. So right now, things are bad. You, we don't have any money. We don't have uh, draft assets to trade up and pick up a quarterback. So many teams need a quarterback in this draft that – it's just almost impossible to acquire one of the top five. It's so from my standpoint, in, in a league where the quarterback is so important, yeah, it, it's bad. And Ryan Pace has made it bad. He dug this big, big asshole. And uh, and now, you know, he's trying to climb out of it. And it just, he, he looks like a desperate GM. Hell, you know, we've become the laughing stop of all the TV talk shows. People are just laughing at the Chicago Bears organization right now, and I don't like that. It really stinks. I I don't like that you didn't give me any positivity because normally I <laughs> normally I'm the one on here saying I'm doom, gloom, hellfire, and brimstone. And then there's Aldo. This little this little Tinkerbell comes on my shoulder. It's like it's not all bad. Like, like, what what the hell? Like now, yes, everything's awful. I've been saying that for months. Everything's awful. The the the, the, the from the top down. Awful ownership, awful. The GM, awful. The president, awful. The coach, awful. The players are awful. I'm everything is everything's awful. Am I being dramatic? Yes, but that's the life of a Bears fan. Everything is just awful, and that's what what a bright note to end this show on. By the way, hey, hey guys, let's go around the horn. Everything's awful. We'll see you next time. Everything's <laughs> so, awful. Yeah. Everything's awful. You know, the, the, the name of this the name of this episode should just be Buffon Fifty Five everything's awful. So. I think we found our new segment. 
Yes, <laughs> that's right. We, 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 we caught our we got our new tagline. Good. Oh, uh, let, let, you know what? Let's try to end on some positivity before we wrap up. I do want to talk about the other show that Alyssa and I host right here on the bar room called Pass the Mic. I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to listen to it. It's a show all about empowering women in sports and sports media. We just wrapped up another episode with Ali Reddick, who was the founder of Athlete Relations. An incredible episode. Uh, we, we talked to a lot of women who are in sports media and are former athletes. This uh, Ali is someone who uh, started her own client relations company where she deals with professional athletes. And we, she really was able to pull back the curtain and show us the other side of sports. Whenever whenever they're not on the field, what's required to make sure that they're – because they are humans. They're not wind-up dolls. They're not just somebody that goes out there and plays for three hours on Sunday and then they go on the shelf until next week. There's a lot that goes into it that we don't think about as fans and, the, and people don't consider actually having effect on these athletes. So there was an incredible uh, interview and also spotlighted some of the struggles that she has gone through as a woman in that industry. Yeah, this our, our entire show, it's just been like an eye-opening experience getting to talk to so many, di a diverse group of women who they come from all different backgrounds and they're in different, you know, different parts of sports uh, and sports media. So, and really interesting getting to, you know, see their journeys, but also hear them voice their struggles because unfortunately, you know, women in sports media are still going through, are, are still being harassed and, you know, they're still being criticized and, you know, it, it, it's frustrating and it's kind of exhausting at this point, but it's still something that needs to be heard. So, you know, we're hoping that we can shine a light on that, uh, bring attention to that, but also celebrate everything that they've been able to accomplish because they've certainly, they've worked their asses off to get to where they are. And it's just really great getting to talk to them and learn. Like, I feel like I learned something new. I, I know I learned something new every time we talk to somebody. So, I mean, we have the women that we've been able to talk to, they're, they bring something really special to this and it's just it's one of the highlights of my week whenever we do get to do this uh and you know it's really it's been really great working on this with you john 100 percent. and like you said it's not just informational and educational for our listeners it has been certainly educational and uh informational to me because i've learned I, like you said we learn something new every single week and we learn about these struggles that are go still going on in 2021 and you and you you hear about these things and maybe you read about them but when someone literally tells you their own personal experience and you hear it from the person who they actually experienced that kind of harassment or that kind of whatever episode that went on, it, it kind of hits you a little bit harder. And it, it really makes you understand that this this stuff this isn't just stuff that is pulled out of the air. This stuff really still happens in the year 2021. And it's important to have these conversations. If we can make one iota of difference, then the show will be a success. So we hope all of you will give the give the show a listen. It's called Pass the Mic. We hope you share it with your friends as well. Absolutely. And let me add that the best way to stay informed with all of the great things happening here at the Bar Room is to visit the newly opened website, barroomnetwork.com. Make sure you bookmark that so it's easy to find and bookmark bearswire.com. I'm the managing editor over there and we've got plenty of news and everything's still awful over there. I just managed to kind of make it seem not so awful sometimes. <laughs> You heard it, guys. Everything's awful. Before we head out, a quick programming note. We'll be back with more off-season specials before and after the NFL draft. And before you know it, OTAs will roll around. The uh, training camp will be here. And I think the 2021 NFL season starts in like 170 days. So the countdown starts now. But that will do it. For this edition of Buffon 55, hopefully we'll be a little more positive on the next episode. We appreciate everyone tuning in on the live version, on the video broadcast, and also, of course, on the audio podcast version. But for Alyssa Barbieri and Aldo Gandia, I'm John Buffon. We'll see you next time.